All right, thank you everyone for joining us today as we continue the Living Earth Collaborative and EEPB Fall Seminar Series. It's with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Yu San Yang for her talk entitled Divergent Mating Behaviors as a Driver of Rapid Evolution, Sexual Selection, Reproductive Isolation, and Eco-Evo Dynamics. Dr. Yang is a behavioral ecologist and evolutionary biologist and one of the new LEC postdoctoral fellows this year. Yusan's research explores how behavior and learning can be powerful driving forces of evolution. She received her bachelor's degree from National Taiwan University and then went on to do her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh with Dr. Corey Richard Zawacki, where she studied color and behavior evolution in the polymorphic strawberry poison frog. During her PhD, she was the recipient of many awards and fellowships, including the Andrew Mellon Predoctoral Fellowship and the Edmonds Award for excellent publications. Speaking of which, Yu San has an incredible publication record with her work published in journals such as Evolution, The American Naturalist, Behavioral Ecology, and Nature. As a postdoc at the Living Earth Collaborative, Yu San will continue to explore how mating behavior mediates rapid evolution in Trinidadian guppies, working in collaboration with four sponsors at Washington University, Dr. Swan Gordon, Andres Lopez Sepocre, Bruce Carlson in the Department of Biology, and Paolo Natenzen in the Department of Economics. A fun fact about Yu San is that when she isn't in the field or the lab, you'll find her on the volleyball court, or at least you would have pre-COVID but she looks forward to being able to get back on the court when it becomes safe to do so. As a reminder, please post questions that you have for Yusan in the live chat during her talk, and we'll be reading those questions to Yusan at the end. Also, if you're a part of the LEC community, please remember to join us for a post-seminar reception on Zoom for additional discussion with the speaker. And with that, I just wanna thank Yusan again for being here today, and we will turn it over to her. Take it away, Yusan. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for the cool and interesting introduction. Um, and it is my immense pleasure to be here to talk to you about my research. On, so yeah, so I will be talking a little bit about what I've been doing uh, in a poison frog system as a PhD student, and then move on to talk about what I plan to do here as an LEC postdoc with the Trinidadian guppies. All right, so going into the introduction. So sexual selection is something that is really fascinating to me uh, as a kid and also fascinating right now. And so it is a selective pressure that is related to reproductive fitness. It is a strong driver of evolution and it has created some of the most bizarre and interesting forms and functions that we find in nature. But it is not only about uh, the morphological ornaments or weapons, but it is also about the diverse mating behaviors uh, that are including Things like female choice, on uh, courtship displays, male male competition, male harassments. And the interesting things about mating behaviors is that it is both the product and the driver of sexual selection. So for example, if we look at female choice, female choice is the product of sexual selection on females that is um, that that is uh, that is the product of on of sexual selection on females to have on um, the highest reproductive output, but it is also the agent of selection that is selecting for um, conspicuous um, male ornaments or also like high quality males and on the signals. And then so my research interest kind of boils down to these two questions. So first one, uh, what drives mating behavior evolution? So what are the environmental factors or on or, or, or the um, evolutionary um, factors that drive mating behaviors? And then in turn, how do these uh, adaptations and mating behaviors drive evolutionary and ecological processes in other aspects? So I will be talking about on um, two main systems that I've worked with. So the divergent mating behaviors and reproductive isolation in the colorful polymorphic poison frogs and the divergent mating behaviors and eco-evolutionary dynamics in the Trinidadian guppies. Okay, so jumping into the first part on the, on the poison frog system. So before going into the research, I have a bunch of people to acknowledge. So none of this will be possible without them. So of course, my wonderful advisor and mentor in grad school, Dr. Corey Richard Zawaki, and also all of the mentors and collaborators that I have had pleasure to work with during my PhD, uh, Drs. Uh, Matt Bugas, uh, Maria Severdio, and Haikapuro. Uh, 
And also there has been tons of master students and undergraduate students that have uh, that I have had the pleasure to work with and many of whom have actually went down to Panama with me and do months of on um, heavy field work and do a lot of the heavy lifting. And so I just need to thank, thank you to them as well. Okay, so um, sexual selection is uh, believed to be a key driver in speciation. So especially when we are seeing divergence in phenotypes and we're seeing this co-divergence of uh, sexual traits and the mate preferences for that trait. And so when this happens, uh, what we will see is a mating pattern called assortative mating. So this is basically means that individuals with similar phenotypes are uh, more likely to mate with each other compared to mating with a different phenotype. And this could limit gene flow between the two groups and eventually uh, may be able to facilitate speciation. So this represents the core mechanisms by which uh, sexual selection drives uh, speciation is pretty much how uh, we are introduced to the concept on, uh, in, in our textbooks. However, there are a couple of non-trivial aspects of sexual selection that I think is missing from this tr traditional paradigm. So for one, uh, when there are female mate choice, when females are choosing among the males that I find attractive, Oftentimes we will also have males that are competing to access these limited number of females. So this is what I called on the dual utility of sexual traits. And uh, the fact is that these key sexual traits during divergence, they oftentimes not only function in female mate choice, but also they will function in male-male competition. However, in speciation research, we'll see that on, when we compare the number of studies between um, female mate choice and male competition, male competition is a lot of times ignored. And the second thing I wanna talk about is on the development of mating behaviors. So uh, if we go back all the way uh, to the era of ethology under Timbergen's framework, we have uh, long known that animal behaviors can be mediated by a number of different processes. So um, for one, uh, animal can behave certain ways because they have alleles or genes that coded them to do so, or they could behave certain ways because they have some past experience or past developmental history that, um, that leads to their current decision-making and current behaviors. And so even if that we know that these are all important components of how behaviors are shaped on um, traditionally in speciation research, mate preferences are often considered genetic in the models. And so that kind of builds up to uh, my dissertation framework. So in short, I, uh, my goal was to add these two different, uh, these two uh, ignore, but I think really important aspects back to the uh, speciation bisexual selection story. So for one, uh, how do male competition in addition to female choice um, influence the evolution of reproductive isolation? And secondly, how does behavioral learning mediate the process? So the system that I work with is the strawberry poison dark frog, uh, Wolfaga familio. So this is a small species um, about an, an inch long and lives in the tropical forest in Central America from Nicaragua, uh, Costa Rica to Panama. And so throughout most of its distribution range, this frog has a very iconic coloration of red body and blue limbs. However, if we zoom into this little area called um, Bocos de Toro Archipelago, what we will see is a wide variety of colorations on different islands and different populations. So all these different colorations that you see here, on, uh, when, when, when they're in the lab, they're still capable of mating with each other. They are capable of producing offsprings that are equally viable, equally fertile. So all in all, they're still considered one species. So these divergence in colorations is believed to, uh, to, to have happened in less than 10,000 years. So this is very rapid evolution. And so in addition to that, this uh, species also has a really interesting uh, life history that uh, involves a lot of aspects of sexual selection. So in the species, the males compete for uh, territories in the forest and they use that territories to vocalize and attract females. Females have larger home ranges and they will sample the males on around and in their home range. And so when uh, the female is satisfied with the courtship, um, usually it's like tactile and vocal on um, the pair will mate and she will lay a clutch of eggs in the male's territory. The males will take care of that clutch of eggs. So that mostly involves hydrating the clutch. So by um, sitting on top of them or peeing on them to keep them hydrated. And um, that will continue until the tackles hatch. 
And then by that point, the mom, uh, the female will come back and then transport the tadpoles on her back to uh, water bodies on in trapezoid plant leaves, for example, like in a bromeliad. And she will feed that tadpole with unfertilized eggs until they metamorphose to little frogs. So this is a great system with uh, no male competition, with female choice, and also with parental care of both sexes that is really suitable to look at how um, reproductive behaviors or mating behaviors influence trait evolution and reproductive isolation. So people have taken advantage of this system and asked the fundamental question of whether mate preferences have diverged along with the divergence of colorations. And so indeed, in these series of studies, on um, people have found on um, in various different uh, color morphs that oftentimes when you feed, uh, offer the female a choice between a male of the same color as her own or a different color, oftentimes the female prefers the same color. So these patterns has been interpreted as reproductive isolation evolving among these different color morphs. Um, but as you might have noticed, on um, their Within this interpretation, there is nothing about male competition, which potentially could be mediated by color. But uh, at that point, we didn't really know uh, how much that is. And also, we did not talk about how these different preferences are shaped. So this builds up nicely to um, my dissertation framework. So we have a system that we already know quite a lot about, but is also missing these two factors that I find uh, really interesting. OK. So breaking my um, projects down to a couple of research questions. So um, the first question that I ask in coming into the system is first looking at whether um, colorations is indeed mediating both female choice and male competition. So we already know that female choice is, but how about male competition? And uh, secondly, upon establishing that they do, so I'm giving that <laughs> away, uh, how do these different selective forces interact with each other to uh, determine uh, mating patterns? And then lastly, the last thing we tackled is whether, is whether these mating behaviors on uh, whether these color biases, are they genetic, are they plastic? And on uh, how does uh, knowing that change our understanding and how mating behaviors drive uh, evolution and drive sensation? All right, so the first question, so looking at coloration and mating behaviors. So on the populations that we chose to work with is a, a red color morph and a blue color morph that haven't been tested for color biases before. And another advantage of picking these two color morphs is that they happen to sit uh, at both ends of the contact zone. So in this region, we have populations that are entirely red, so kind of like the ancestral color morph with red body and blue limbs. And at the southern part of Teria Oscura, we have um, populations that have frogs that are entirely blue. And in the region called Dolphin Bay, we have frogs that are entirely red, frogs that are entirely blue, and those that are kind of brownish in the middle, the phenotypic intermediates that are occurring in the same population. So this presents a really unique opportunity for us to not only look at whether the behaviors have evolved along with the coloration, but also whether they remain the same in on uh, our patri and when they meet in St. Patri. Okay, so the first thing that we tackled was the basis of on uh, the speciation by sexual selection theory, so the divergent female preferences. So what we did is we went out and sampled along this on uh, contact zone and uh, collected females from uh, the entirely red populations, the entirely blue populations, and uh, the three different color morphs from the polymorphic populations, so red, blue, and intermediates. So what we did is we assayed these females for their preference. So this is a behavioral arena viewed from above. The female is free to roam around uh, this arena, and the males, these three males of different colors, they're trapped under transparent plastic films. So we use the time that this female spent in proximity with each of these three males as a proxy of the preference, which will be shown here in the y-axis as association time in seconds. And on her, uh, the time that she spent with each of the three males will be color coded. Okay, so what we found uh, first is that in the entirely red populations, the females prefer to associate with the red males more. And in the entirely blue population, the females instead prefer to associate with the blue male. So this is um, kind of in congruence with what people have found in uh, other color morphs in the species. So basically the females are preferring the same color and uh, which is the assorted preference that we predict to, uh, to, to elicit reproductive isolation. 
But what I think is really interesting is when we look at this polymorphic population, instead of keeping the red preferring red, blue preferring blue pattern that we are expecting to see, what we actually saw is that regardless of the female zone coloration, everybody prefers red. And then so this actually suggests that these divergent preferences that occurred in allopatry does not necessarily mean that they will have the same pattern when these two colomorphs are in sympatry in the same population. Okay, so this is the female side of the story. So uh, we also looked at what the males are doing. So again, we sampled across this transition zone. So on in the red population, the blue populations and the polymorphic populations. And we um, did something called simulated territorial intrusion, which is looking at the male's aggression biases towards uncertain phenotypes. So what we did is we 3D printed these models that are like super tiny, and then we hand painted them to match the coloration of the actual frogs. We then uh, hooked that to a servo control so we can move the frogs around, and we coupled that with call playback. So essentially we're creating a robot frog. And also with some help of an um, Amazon supply planter. So, um, so if you haven't looked at the review for science on uh, hashtag, this was a while ago, but I find it to be a really great source in finding, um, I guess, equipment for the field from like everyday products. So yeah, so anyway, so this is what we did. We have this robot frog set up. We took it down to Panama to the different uh, populations. We find a male's territory and we set the whole apparatus down for some acclimation time. And then we turn it on and see what happens. So this is <laughs> this is a footage from the experiment. So this is our model frog and we have our very angry territorial uh, male that is fighting with them. So as I said, we go across different populations. We have on uh, samples males of different colors and we use stimulus males of different colors. They're pretty fun to watch. Okay, so this is the result that we got from, uh, from the experiments, 372 experiments uh, trials later, uh, we have this pattern. So again, on the x-axis, we have the four population. We have the entirely red population, entirely blue populations, and two polymorphic populations that are of different color frequencies because we were interested in um, potential frequency dependence effect. On the y-axis is the proportion of the males attacking the model. So this is um, basically looking at um, out of all the males that I've tested, on um, how what percentage of them end up being really aggressive and escalating the contest into the, the higher suppression form, which is wrestling, as you just see in the video. And on um, the model color will be color coded as well. All right, so what do we find? So first, in the entirely red population, what we saw is that the males are more aggressive when the intruder is red. And in the blue population, the, the males are more aggressive when the intruder is blue. So this is following um, kind of the pattern that we see in females as well. They are more aggressive to the same color in the population. So what about the polymorphic population? So when we look at them, we saw something interesting again. So Again, we are not seeing on um, the predicted pattern that should have persisted from um, what we saw in a two allopatric population. Instead, regardless of the male zone coloration, regardless of the intruder's coloration, everybody seems to have equal amount of aggression um, going on. So there are but nothing as significant as the two monomorphic populations. Okay, so from these two parts of the project, we, um, do, we did establish the dual utility of the sexual trait that we were talking about in the beginning. So coloration does mediate both female choice and male competition in our poison frogs. And we also find that the patterns that we found in allopatric populations are not necessarily maintained in sympatric populations. So this is, to me, is an indicator that behaviors can evolve or change very rapidly. And we do need to take this into account when we are considering, um, we're inferring, I guess, evolutionary trajectory from allopatrically diverged populations, which is something that we do a lot um, in, in speciation research. Okay. All right, so uh, now that we know that both male competition and female choice are both mediated by color, how do these two forces interact with each other? So, um, so in a couple of other systems in which both male and female mating behaviors are, uh, are, are mediated by the mating traits, a pattern that people have found over and over again is that usually males of different phenotypes, they differ in their competitive ability as well. 
And so this is actually something that is uh, that we found in our in the poison frogs as well. So on um, uh, in in a study by Rod et al. in 2013 on um, using a mirror test, basically um, they found that different colomorphs differ drastically in their aggression level. So overall, the more conspicuous you are, it seems like you are uh, you tend to be more aggressive. And then so this could potentially translate to competitive asymmetry. If these colomores were to meet um, in, in the same population. So what this means for the evolution of reproductive isolation is that male competition can disproportionately eliminate some phenotypes from the mating pool in which the females will choose from. So in other words, even if females have on uh, certain preferences, if the pool that she is choosing from does not have that available male, then basically we're not seeing the expression of the females. So in this project, we are explicitly testing this hypothesis that male competition limits a female from choosing her preferred phenotype. So to do this in the poison frogs, we designed experiments with two treatment groups, which we termed uh, attractive winner and attractive loser. So in the attractive winner group, we offer the female a choice between a, a male that is on um, territorial and also bears the attractive color and a loser male that is also unattractive. <laughs> And in attractive loser group, we have the female choose between a territorial male that is unattractive and um, a loser male that has the attractive color. And then so we have um, we have a, a, a treatment that the male-male competition and female preference are operating in the same direction and a treatment where they are operating in opposing directions. So by comparing the mating patterns of these two treatments, we can then look at the interactions and relative strength of male competition and female preference, which are both mediated by color and see how that influences on the ultimate mating pattern that we're getting. Okay, so this, is, this was an experiment done in a breeding colony at the University of Pittsburgh in the Richards Wacky Lab. And so we chose from the, some of the morphs that we have on, and these morphs also are, were demonstrated before to show a sort of the preference. So the female basically preferred the, same, the male that has the same color as her own. So logistically, how it was done is, is like this. So this is a typical breeding tank in our colony. We have plants, we're over position. We have PVC pipes filled with water that, um, that the females can put tackles in. And so what we did is first we introduced two males that are on of the same size but of different color morphs, and we let them compete for dominance. And so because this is what we will see when um, we put two males together. So basically they fight for dominance, they wrestle a lot. Um, this process can take hours or um, even days. So what we did is we frequently come back and uh, we observe the behaviors and we operationally define the contest as resolved when we have three consecutive observations of the same dominance relationship, which is inferred by the behaviors. So once we have a winner and a loser established, we introduce the females. In the attractive winner group, we introduce a female that preferred the winner's color. And in the attractive loser group, we introduce a female that prefers on uh, the loser's color. And then, so we kept these trios together until they produced tackles, and then we genotype the adults and the tackles and use microsatellite markers to infer paternity. So figure out who the dad is for these tackles. Okay, so this is on um, the results that we got from this experiment. So just to remind you, we have two treatment groups in which um, the females are choosing from an attractive winner and an unattractive loser or she's choosing from an unattractive, sorry, she's choosing from an attractive loser and an unattractive winner. And these will be shown in darker shades, uh, darker and lighter shades respectively. Uh, in this graph, the X axis is on the, the female's color morph. Um, so the, the, the photo in the first color is the color morph of the females and the colors in parentheses are the males that she's asked to choose from. So we have it separated by color morph and all the pattern will be over here. The y-axis is the proportion of the female that made it assortatively by color. So in other words, the degree to which the female made it according to her preference. So just to set up some expectations. So if mating is random, uh, as in uh, the no expectation, what we will see is around 50% of mating across the board, so mate, uh, random mating. If female color preference is the main determinant of mating patterns here, 
what we should see is that the females will mate with her preferred color in um, both of the treatment. Or alternatively, if male territorial status is a stronger driver here, what we should see is a very strong effect of territorial treatment. So the female should mate with the winner when uh, mate with her preferred color when he is the winner, but not so much when he is the territorial loser. Okay. So with these expectations in mind, this is the pattern that we got. And so from both from the visual and also from the statistical test, we can see that there is a really strong effect of territorial treatment, which basically means that yes, male territorial status is actually the stronger driver here. So uh, from this experiment, we saw that the outcome of male male competition can indeed limit the female from choosing her preferred color, and so this means that these on uh, male male competition that is mediated by color does has an important role in determining mating patterns and consequently the evolution of reproductive isolation. Okay, so that's the second part. And then so the last thing we tackled on uh, is uh, how these color mediated behaviors are shaped. Are they genetic? Are they plastic? And upon knowing that, how does that change our understanding of how behavior drives evolution? So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, mating behaviors, they are traditionally considered uh, genetic in speciation models, despite the fact that we know a lot of behaviors can be shaped by learning and, and can also drive very different evolutionary trajectories compared to genetic behaviors. So one form of learning that has caught the attention of, um, of evolutionary biologists is sexual imprinting. So sector imprinting is the phenomenon by which offspring learns parental traits and later use them as a model of species recognition. So the most prominent example perhaps is Lorenz's gosling. So when these goslings hatch, if the first thing they see out of their shell is a human, then they will, um, as juveniles, follow that human around. And when they're sexually mature, they will attempt to socialize with humans and on um, display courtship behaviors with humans as well. So basically how they develop a species recognition. So this is um, something that's really interesting to evolutionary biologists because it is a method that can very uh, rapidly generate co-divergence of trait and preference. So imagine in a population, you have a novel trait pop up and then by imprinting in the next generation, you will automatically has, have this preference as well. So um, this has been demonstrated in over hundred species of birds. It also has been in some mammals and more recently in some fishes with parental care. So uh, species like cichlids or sticklebacks. Um, but as you have noticed on um, by this point, we haven't had um, any evidence in amphibians. So that's what we wanted to test in our frogs. And uh, the reason, kind of the reason that we want to test it is come from their observations of their uh, natural history. So, these tadpoles, as I mentioned earlier, they rely entirely on the mom's uh, on fertilized eggs as their food source. So when the mom visits, um, the tadpole actually exhibit this um, begging behavior, so vibrating against the mom's body. And so we think during this time, there are plenty of opportunities for the tadpoles to learn the mom's trait. So we are hypothesizing that the tadpoles can imprint on the mother's color when they are begging for food. So much like a baby bird would do. So to test this hypothesis, we designed a real experiment on to, to test these two alternative hypotheses. This was also done in the breeding colony on, uh, that, is, that is currently in the University of Pittsburgh. And so the experimental design has three different treatment groups. So the purebred group, the crossbred group, and the cross poster group. So in a purebred group, uh, we have uh, socially naive individuals produced by parents of the same color. So it's kind of like business as usual on um, in the well population that only has one color. And in the crossbred group, we cross on um, parents that are of different colors to, to produce a hybrid on um, interest color mores. And lastly, in the cross foster group, we swap the tadpoles between two differently colored parents and that then raise the tadpoles to sexual maturity, sorry, to, to um, metamorphosis. And then so upon metamorphosis, we keep these uh, juvenile frogs uh, in isolation until they are uh, sexually mature. And so by that point, we then assay the males and the females for their behavior. So females for their preference, males for their aggression biases using an apparatus that is very similar to what I talked about in the very beginning. Um, so in a purebred group, we assay the individual's bias against um, their own color and a contrasting color. Uh, in the crossbred group, we assay them against the mother's color uh, versus the father's color. 
And in the cross foster group, uh, we assayed them to choose between the foster parent's color and the biological parent's color. So combining these, we can tease apart whether these behaviors are genetic or learned um, or both. Okay, so these are the results that we have. Um, so just to orient you, we have female preference on the left and male aggression biases on the right. On the x-axis, we have our three varying treatments on the purebred group, the crossbred group, and the cross foster group. The y-axis is the proportion um, of the association time that the female spent with either of the stimulus male. So anything that deviates from this 0.5 line means that there is a bias and the direction of that bias is labeled on top and bottom of this graph uh, respectively. Okay. All right, so the first thing that we found uh, when we look at the purebred group is that these juveniles, they grew up to prefer their own color over a contrasting color. So this is great because this may basically means that being reared in a lab is not messing with the development of um, the, the female preference or, um, behaviors. Um, so secondly, when we look at the crossbred group, what we found really interestingly is that these juveniles actually grew up to prefer the mother's color over the father's color. So this is really interesting because that means whatever influence they're getting from the mom, be that genetic or be that learning, is more important than that of the dad. And lastly, what I think is really exciting and really interesting is in this cross fold circuit. So instead, uh, so what we saw that these juveniles do is that they grew up to pre um, prefer the foster parents' color over the biological parents' color. So this is really cool because this is a really strong indicator that these behaviors are actually learned instead of coded, coded genetically. And so when we look at what happens with the males, we basically find the same pattern. So um, the, in a purebred group, they prefer, they uh, are more aggressive towards their own color. They are more aggressive towards the mother's color in the crossbred group. And they are more aggressive toward the parent, foster parent's color in the cross foster group. So together, this means that both, seems like both female preference and male aggression, which is both on um, color biased, is shaped by parental imprinting and more specifically on uh, imprinting on the mother's color as we hypothesize in um, in in in, in a, uh, unfertilized eggs feeding. So, which is super exciting because uh, this is on, um, as far as we know, the first evidence of amphibians imprinting. And it seems like it uh, influenced not only the females, but also the males as well. Yeah. So to add to that excitement, on um, this finding also has very significant in, uh, uh, implications on the evolution of reproductive isolation. So as you might have guessed, genetic behaviors and um, learned behaviors can lead to very different evolutionary outcomes. So what we did is uh, we built a diploid population model to explore how imprinted preferences plus uh, imprinted aggression can together drive speciation. So very shortly, uh, we have uh, coloration that is genetically determined. We have a dominant allele and then recessive allele. So this is a diploid model. And then we have behavioral biases. So this is referring to both female preference and male aggression biases, which uh, is determined, determined by imprinting. So in the model, we actually did both maternal imprinting and paternal imprinting just for um, completion's sake. So on um, the life cycles of these models have uh, three main steps. So in male competition, um, we uh, calculate the total amount of aggression each color more uh, receives based on their aggression biases. And then we calculate the effective frequency of the male color morphs that enters the mating pool in which the females can choose from. So you can think of these as territorial males. And so in the next step, the females then choose the males based on their preferences um, that are acquired by imprinting and also by encounter probability, so the relative frequency that you have in the population. So in this step, the females follow strict polygyny, so this means that all females have equal reproductive success, and direct sexual selection is operating on the males only. And lastly, in uh, using this uh, pairing information, we can then calculate the color more frequency and the behavior frequency in the next generation, and then we go back, recur uh, set up the recursion equation, and then go back to the male male competition again. So this is the model. And uh, we focus our analysis of this model on, on two criteria that have previously been found to be the main challenges of speciation by sexual selection models. And so the first challenge is maintaining the variations of trait and preferences. This is important because if you don't have, if you lose on uh, the preferences uh, 
in, in a population, basically you're not going anywhere in terms of association. And uh, the secondly is the difficulty of maintaining trait preference association. So in a population, even if you have um, trait and pref preference um, variation, but those variations are not tightly linked in a way that will segregate the two phenotypic groups, then you will also not get on um, reproductive isolation or association. So only when we have both of these factors on um, overcome, then we will uh, have the potential to progress the system towards association. Okay, so on the first part, the maintaining trait and preference variation. So this is a contour plot looking at the influence of two important parameters that we can toggle in our model. So on on the x axis is female preference strengths alpha. You can think of it as, as how strong on um, selection is via female choice. And on the y axis is male aggression by strength beta, which you can think of it as how strong male male competition is. So what we did is we looked through different parameter combinations, look at whether the um, polymorphism can be maintained or polymorphism would be lost, and then um, go through all the possible combinations. And this is what uh, a contour plot that we get. So to kind of break it down a little bit about the patterns, um, as we increase on um, selection via female choice, the system is less likely to stay polymorphic, and this is because selection via female choice is positive frequency dependent. On the other hand, if we increase on male male competition strength, on we actually tend to preserve polymorphism in the system because on um, what we have from male male competition is on uh, negative frequency dependent. And then so together, on um, this means that maintaining the mating trait variation and uh, preference trait variation as a consequence is dependent on both processes and also the relative strength of, um, of, of the female preference in the male competition. So that's the first challenge. Um, after getting a stable polymorphism, we still need to have this tight association between the trait and the preference in order for the system to have a chance to progress the speciation. And then so we look at the scenarios that will lead to the, this high uh, association. We calculated something called uh, the phenogenotypic linguistic disequilibrium. Uh, this is very similar to how you calculate on uh, the linkage equilibrium between two different node sites. Just right now, we're calculating something that's uh, a genotype and a phenotype because of the learned behavior. And so basically a measure of how tightly linked the trait and the preferences are. So uh, what we found in the model when we analyze them is that actually this trait preference association has nothing to do with how strong male competition is but it increases as um, female, uh, female choice increases. And then so as we have stronger female choice, we have a stronger linkage between a trait and a preference. And uh, as a consequence, we are more likely to develop reproductive isolation between the two forms. Okay, so um, to, so to, to summarize, reproductive isolation, um, according to the model in imprinted female preference and male male aggression, it is most likely to evolve when we have high um, female preference or high female choice because we need these strong trait preference association to, um, to limit the gene flow. However, we cannot do so without strong male male competition to kind of counter the positive frequency dependent selection that is created by really strong um, female weight choice. So um, to break it down mechanistically, the implications of these imprinted behaviors is that rival imprinting, which is imprinting that creates uh, aggression biases, they are key to maintaining stable polymorphism because they can generate negative frequency dependent selection. And then sexual imprinting is actually the key step in um, generating, uh, in limiting gene flow between the two, uh, two, two divergent groups. And then so on, so this is really exciting because like we are providing, uh, I guess, a, a novel mechanism of how sexual selection alone could, might be able to drive speciation, which if you're familiar with the speciation uh, literature, it is something that um, people have always found to be really difficult and under really st stringent conditions. And so with this model, even if it's a really simple population genetics model, it kind of opens up this, um, I guess, uh, novel idea of how sexual selection alone can, uh, can do this. All right, so that is the end of my um, PhD research in this talk. So I will just part with a couple of take home messages that I think that I took away from my PhD and which I think is not specific to the frog size study, but onto a lot of other organisms as well. 
So first is that divergent sexual traits is, as I said repeatedly over and over again, mediating multiple processes, mediating male competition, mediating female choice. And we do need to consider both of these um, processes in reproductive isolation or uh, evolution in general, because mating patterns, which is the ultimate determinant of gene flow, is determined by all these different processes. And lastly, I would like to pull attention to uh, the learned mating behaviors, uh, which um, compared to genetic behaviors can have very different evolutionary trajectories. And so, um, and, and we do need to, to think about them more uh, in terms of their implication on speciation or evolution in general. All right, so that's the end of the poison frog story. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little about on um, how uh, the projects that I uh, want, I am starting to do and also will be doing here as a uh, living of collaborative postdoc. And so um, on the Trinidadian guppies. And so this is a project on that I will be doing with the four mentors on at University, uh, Washington University at St. Louis, and they are all uh, living her collaborative cells as well. So Dr. Swan Warren, uh, Andres Lopez Tocque, um, Bruce Carlson, and Paolo Tenzin. And I would also like to acknowledge the on the, some of the undergrads that has already started doing these research with me. So Shana, Zakia, and Courtney, and I look forward to um, progressing the, the projects more with you guys. Okay, um, so towards the end of my PhD, I am thinking a lot about how behaviors, especially um, I guess non-genetic behaviors contribute to evolution. So a lot of times behavioral plasticity or um, you can call it behavioral plas uh, flexibility or context dependent behaviors is a first response to a changing environment. And so that could really dictate the evolutionary trajectory of, uh, of populations. So an example that I really like recently is uh, about urban noise and the evolution of bird songs during COVID shutdowns. So this is the, uh, I guess, the traffic level of on um, during in the San Francisco area during the shutdowns on um, in the early months of 2020. So that on uh, the traffic level drops back down to a really low historical level, historical level, and so does the background noise. Um, and um, so the, the white crown sparrows in the area actually respond really rapidly to these different changes. So they started to sing softer songs because they are not, now not masked with these background noises. And they actually have um, more elaborate songs in terms of um, frequency bandwidth and that are um, more attractive to females. So this is essentially re uh, reversing the effects of half a century of noise pollution. So I think this is really cool because it demonstrates not only how behavioral plasticity can uh, really be a facilitator of adaptation, but also that behaviors and the plasticity can kind of shield trait variations from disappearing uh, from big environmental fluctuations. And so moreover, these behavioral shifts, either it's genetic or it's plastic, can actually have on higher level uh, ecological consequences, including higher up to the ecosystem level. So uh, one of the classic examples, as a lot of you might know, is um, comes from the, um, I guess, the, the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone, or some of you might know it as the ecological fear study. So in short, the reintroduction of wolves changes the behaviors of the elk's foraging. And this non diesel effect actually has a really drastic cascading effect and changes the community and uh, community structure and the ecosystem functions in Yellowstone. So this is kind of known in the past as a story of how wolves changes river. And, um, and so this kind of like sets me up to the framework that I am hoping to explore in the Trinidadian guppies. So we have on uh, the environments that the, the, the animals are in shapes their behaviors through uh, evolutionary processes. So genetic adaptations, plastic adaptations, and these behaviors in turn uh, can drive various ecological processes in different levels that will change the environment. And then so this is uh, what, we, what we can call like eco-evolutionary dynamics. And the specific behaviors, as you might have guessed, that I'm interested in looking at is on mating behaviors. And so despite that sexual selection has among the highest, on um, uh, the, the, the strongest um, selection pressure on trait evolution, um, mating behaviors actually been not been included as much in the recent hype of eco-evolutionary dynamic studies. And so this, I think this really represents a gap in our knowledge and is something that I'm hoping to explore here as the OEC postdoc. So yeah, so I'm working on, I'm 
doing this in the Trinidadian guppies. Um, these are small freshwater light-bearing fish that are native to South America. Uh, and also it's invasive in a lot of the areas in other parts of the world. So they are sexually dimorphic, dimorphic the females being pretty cryptic, and the males uh, are smaller and have these really bright colorations that are mostly used for uh, attracting females. So this study, uh, sorry, this species is a model system for rapid adaptation, and it's particularly um, attractive to a lot of researchers because of their repeated colonization from uh, a, a high predation environment to uh, a lower predation environment in the headwater streams. <clears throat> okay, so a very abbreviated version of the guppy story. So guppy um, historically um, coexist with their natural predators. Um, the um, uh, a very prominent one being the pike cichlids. And uh, as they naturally colonize headwater streams swimming up on um, the, the, uh, the waterfalls, they are free from these predation risks and they quickly evolve a suite of behavior, a suite of traits, including behaviors and morphology that adapt them to the environment. So an example that is very significant is colorations and behaviors. So in the low predation populations, the males are conspicuous, uh, the females are choosy uh, on these different colorations, and the males actually have a, a really elaborate courtship displays that attract females. Whereas in these high predation areas, the males are much duller because um, these, high, these colorations are actually a really high risk for the predators to detect them. The females are less choosy, again, perhaps because of the limitation of predation risk, on uh, uh, increasing their sampling costs. And also the males are usually utilize sneak mating, so um, try, uh, trying to mate with the females but not courtship instead of doing a frequent courtship as in the uh, low predation populations. And so these are uh, what the behaviors look like. So this is um, the, the males actually use a really uh, significant courtship displays to the females. So they will arch their bodies to show off their colors. And as you can see, the females do show preferences for these colorations and on um, behavior. Or the female or the males could adopt a different uh, strategy, which is trying to mate with the females without courtship using gonopodia, which is the um, uh, a modified um, anal fin that used to transfer turn, and then leads to a lot of chasing around the females and harassing them. And uh, also these behavioral repertoires, so the displays and also the gonopodia swings, they are also used in the context of male-male competition as well. So these are two males, they are um, showing off to each other and there are also chases and bites. So these behaviors, as I mentioned earlier, are drastically different uh, between the different uh, predation regimes. And um, so I'm really interested in um, how these behaviors evolved and also what is the evolutionary and, and ecological consequences of them. Okay, so breaking down uh, of the couple of aims uh, very briefly, because I'm running out of time. So the first one uh, that I am addressing is uh, whether on, as we hypothesize, do these mating behaviors actually scale up to influence ecosystem processes? And the hypothesis that we are testing is that the sexual conflict intensity will, um, that is different between high and low predation populations will change the foraging behavior, space use, and a, a, a ton of other things in the population. And because these guppies sit as a really important spot in the food webs of these streams, and that they spend so much of their time doing, um, doing sexual interactions. So I think for males, it could be over 50% of the time is devoted to chasing females around. And so this could um, could scale up to, um, to to community level or on ecological sorry uh, ecosystem level processes. So how we plan to do that is through um, through a mesocosm studies, which we are hoping to do next summer at Tyson Research Center. So in the mesocosms, we will set up um, so that they have important components on as in their original habitat. So algae and detritus, invertebrates, and on um, guppies. We will estimate the population, community, and ecosystem parameters in these mesocosms. And in terms of treatment groups, we will have a two by two factorial design with male phenotype, high and low predation, versus uh, female phenotype, high and low predation. So this will act, th this setup will change the intensity of sexual conflict that are driven by behavior interactions in these different groups. And we can see if that ch these changes will actually scale up to, um, to influence population level, community level, and even ecosystem level processes. So this is the first part. 
And the second part we are hoping to test is how these behaviors uh, evolve in the first place and what is the role of behavioral plasticity in it. So uh, we are using a common daughter experiment, which will dissect what is driving these uh, many behavior variations. And then so under the common thematic of the common garden experiment, we have populations are differentiated, we rear them in common conditions. So for example, we can rear them in uh, either with uh, predator queue or without predator queue. So any differences that we find in these source populations will be genetic evolution. Anything differences that we find between the uh, rearing conditions will be plasticity. And the plasticity difference between the two populations will be an indicator of evolution of plasticity. So using the same setup, we can uh, swap out the rearing conditions and look at different factors. So for example, I'm also very interested in whether on um, seeing adult behaviors during the development stage, so as a juvenile, will change on um, uh, agape's behavior. So we can uh, rear the, the two populations with tutors of different phenotypes, and again, use this schematic to look at on um, the evolution of genes, the evolution of plasticity and their interactions. So, Keeping this kind of logic of the common garden in mind, what we actually set out to do is a huge uh, experiment, a uh, common garden experiment that crosses a lot of these factors that we think is important in um, many behavior development. So we have uh, density treatments, we have um, fish that are uh, housed in high density and low density, which will translate to higher interactions within the cohort and low interaction. Half of them will be um, pr uh, provided with predator Q to stimulate a high predation environment. Half of them will be controlled. And also lastly, in a cross manner, we will also provide them with behavioral tutors that are either low predation uh, phenotype or high predation phenotype. So with this like, huge and complicated common garden experiment, we will be able to dissect the relative contribution of um, genetic evolution plasticity evolution, and also potentially cultural evolution in mating behavior adaptation. So that's the second part. And then lastly, uh, I'm hoping to quantitate, quantitatively explore the role of mating behavior plasticity in eco-evolutionary dynamics. And so the way of doing that is through mathematical models. So in the common garden experiment, we are gathering on uh, data that is how um, behaviors evolve under different environmental conditions. In a mesocosm experiment, we're looking at how behaviors then in turn can change the behaviors. And so adding these together into a model, then we can um, kind of put together how this uh, ecological process, eco evolutionary processes and uh, ecological processes can kind of like go in this feedback loop. Okay, so this is the projects that I am hoping to do in, a, um, in the following two years. And hopefully I will have something to present to you all by the end of it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, so that is all, and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you for that fascinating talk, Yusan. That was amazing. So I just wanna remind everyone um, to post questions in the chat. Oh, it looks like we actually have a number of questions and only a little bit of time. So I'll go ahead oh, sorry. and start. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and start with the first question, which comes from Mike Moore. This question is, to what extent do you think imprinting versus environmental factors are responsible for the geographic variation in the color more frequency? E, okay, for the color more frequency. Um, it's a good question. Um, yeah. So I think for, for, for these poison frogs specifically, I think a lot of the studied populations, they are actually uh, monomorphic. So like not different in uh, so like just having one single color in a population and on um, and for the for those ones that have multiple colorations i yeah the short answer is i don't actually know what would be like the drive the main driver of those um those frequency because i i think the um the difficulty of these type of evolutionary study is that what we are seeing is snapshot in time so we don't know if these um, color, more, color polymorphism is stable or not. So we don't actually know if it's coming from like if two morphs just met and then we're just in the transition state or they have been in, um, in, in a polymorphic state for a very long time and would be. So yeah, yeah, I guess that's like all I can answer. So definitely I think sexual selection has a part to play in it, but also on um, 
environmental factors or things like, so these are apples and metacoloration. So predation definitely has a lot to do with these. And so that's like a whole another uh, <laughs> range of studies in these poison frogs about their polymorphisms. <clears throat> Fantastic talk, Josanne, thank you. Uh, we have more questions here. This is a question from John Birmingham. Okay. Is there a relationship between behavioral imprinting and either genetic imprinting or chromatin mm -hmm. conformation? Um, I don't think so, but I couldn't, I can't rule it out, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, like it's for, for, yeah, that's like one part of that experiment. It's, it's hard to figure out whether uh, that imprinting or what we call imprinting effect comes from the cognition of seeing a mother's color or um, coming from the, um, well, I guess like the, yeah, okay, sorry, let me start over. So I, I don't think the, um, the behavior imprinting has anything to do with the chromatin imprinting since we swapped out the tackles. So anything that is related to genetic is kind of um, separate out in our experiment. So what I think could be another confounding factor would come from the mom feeding the eggs to the tapos. So because we swap out on the, the tapos and then the tapos are actually getting the eggs from the moms of their foster mom. So these behavioral differences uh, we think is most likely coming from cognitive um, impressions on the mom, but it could potentially also come from the eggs that the moms are feeding the tapos. So, so yeah, so so we couldn't say that it's definitely imprinting, but I think that's the most likely explanation. But um, but but I do think it's very distinct from from the chromatin uh, imprinting. Yeah. Okay, great. So <clears throat> the next question that we have is from Matt Austin. He asks if poison frog color is aposematic. Have people also looked at how spatial turnover and predator composition may affect poison frog color polymorphism? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's like a huge uh, area of research in the poison frogs. Um, yeah, so usually what people predict with aposematic coloration is that because it's um, it's kind of like if you, the higher frequency you have in a population, the more effective you are as an aposematic signal because it provides more learning opportunity for the predators. So usually people predict on um, positive frequency dependent selection in aposematic coloration, and then that tends to bring um, monomorphic copulation, so having just one color morph um, per area. So the interesting things with these poison frogs is that in other poison frog species, predation has usually been found to be a really strong driver, but somehow for these different color morphs on these different islands, people had really not found on, I guess, like what you call local protection. So if we put, so that basically means that in a red population, being red or being blue actually doesn't matter for predation risk. So how people have done this is put out clay models and look at predation risks of different coloration. And it seems like in a couple of different um, populations that people have looked at, there isn't actually a lot of local projection. So it's kind of a mystery of why this is. So this could be because like islands have tend to have like lower um, diversity in predator community so that, or, or lower predation risk in these ones. And potentially because Bocas is a region that is also influenced by a lot of orthopogenic changes. So these colors may have been selected um, by predation in the past, but currently there aren't, um, it seems like there aren't too much evidence that predation is um, having a strong effect on these color polymorphisms. Yeah. Well, I mean, like there are still like some influence, but like not a very direct, um, I guess, local protection in terms of what we have in a population. Great. So I think we have uh, time just for one more question. So this is from James Trout. There is a comment and a question. What a fabulous seminar, he said. One quick question. If the processes of assortative mating and behavioral reinforcement you identify are the presumed drivers of speciation in dark frogs, then it may suggest that sister species, especially those relative recently diverged, should be expected to be highly divergent in color? Mm -hmm. Okay, so wait, I'm um, sorry, can you read that question one more time? 
Yes, absolutely. If the processes of assortative mating and behavioral reinforcement you identify are the presumed drivers of speciation in dark frogs, then it may suggest that sister species, especially those relatives recently diverged, should be expected to be highly divergent in color? Yeah, potentially. So, yeah, so if, if um, I guess, sexual selection is the main driver of speciation. So, so for dark frogs, it's a little bit, um, I think for me, it would feel a little bit more complicated because there are also a lot of variations in reproductive behaviors on in these dark frogs. So a lot of them have parental care, but it's not necessarily the mom that takes care of the tapos. Sometimes the dad, only the dad takes care of the tapos. So the dad brings the tapos somewhere else. They don't provide eggs, but but they are the one that's like tending the tapos in that stage. And um, yeah, so so I think it's a little more complicated if we include that into a phylogenetic analysis. Um, yeah, but I think that's actually also something that I am actually really interested in looking at. So seeing how like across the phylogenetic tree, does uh, mating behavior or like the, the form of parental care actually coincides with, um, I guess like how their behaviors are in terms of, um, in terms of sexual selection and yeah, potentially speciation rate, but feels very difficult to do, but <laughs> great question. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Hmm. Maybe, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, I think we got through most of them though, which is great. Yay. So thank you again, Yusan, for a fantastic talk and to everyone for tuning in and for your really insightful questions. And also, we hope that you'll join us for our post-seminar reception on Zoom if you're available. Thanks again. Do we stop streaming? <laughs> I'm, I'm ending the stream, so end. <laughs>